We got a couple minutes, so <laughs> I know it got real quiet real quick. <laughs> I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent Dis School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is now 6 p.m. If you would, please stand as Mr. Scott Kidd leads us in the invocation, and Mr. Datron Williams in the Pledges of Allegiance. Uh, just real quick, since it's the summertime, I just wanted to just take a second and just uh, say how truly blessed I feel to work with all the CISD family and extremely honored to work with uh, these board members, their passion and commitment to our students. They, they truly raised the bar and uh, uh, I'm trying to keep up. So I'm going to I'm going to pray for me and the board members and <laughs> for us tonight. Uh, if you'd like to, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for your for your love. Thank you for your grace. Dear God, thank you for our differences and our diversity. And we we ask that you may show us the same type of grace and and, and the same type of love to, to give to each other. Dear God, tonight we pray for discernment. We pray for wisdom and direction and guidance and the decisions that we make. And we uh, just pray that you help us keep our focus and our efforts and our resources. Uh, in the best interest of our children and our students, Lord. You guys, specifically uh, tonight, I uh, lift up and pray for the Stay family. Uh, just uh, be with uh, with them and, and their church and their community as they begin to heal. And, and dear God, I, I pray for the protection of our students for this summer, uh, for this fall, and throughout the school year, Lord. Just, uh, Lord, please protect them. Thank you for being here, and then uh, it's in your name that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Kidd, Mr. Williams. Item 2A, Awards and Recognition, <coughs> CISD Education Foundation Report. Dr. Stockton. We're honored tonight to have the president of the CISD Education Foundation uh, with us, Nelda Blair. So, Ms. Blair, take it from here, please. Thank you so much. And I have with me our executive director, Maris Blair, who's taken over a large part of the running of this foundation over the past year and who <coughs> prepared the report that's in front of you. This looks like this. I'm going to go through it very, very quickly with you. And if we have any of our teachers uh, or students that have uh, received awards this year with us, we're going to ask them to come up here in just a moment. Normally, we make this presentation in June. Uh, usually, it's not July, so everybody's not normally on vacation. Uh, but we're a little bit late this year. We're sorry for that. We had a conflict in June. The first thing I want you to take a look at is this is kind of our overall uh, look at what we've done over the past many years from uh, this foundation was organized in 2001, but as you can see, it's actually the past, um, within 10 years, that we have really blossomed and been able to give back to uh, the CISD family, as uh, Mr. Kidd so well put it. As you can see, we've given out scholarships uh, awarded to students in the $500 to $1,200 range. We've given out nearly $300,000 in scholarships, and we're very, very proud of that. That's to students. And even as importantly, since we've been giving out educator scholarships over the past few years, and what I mean by that is if you're a CISD teacher or administrator who wants to further your education and achieve a higher degree, then we'll help you do that. And we've given out uh, almost $80,000 at $500 a pop to 153 different educators that are go have gone on to, uh, some of them multiple, that have gone on to get higher degrees. And we're really pleased about that because to us, that is increasing the assets of CISD, the most important asset being your people. We give a welcome back sign-on bonus. Now, we started doing this back in 2007. It's only a $100 MasterCard, but it is to every Conroe ISD graduate who comes back to work at Conroe or teach at Conroe ISD. So when they sign back on that first year after graduating from college, we give them this $100 MasterCard. It is by far the most popular thing that we do. <laughs> if we miss someone, we hear about it, trust me. <laughs> This year, for the first time, we decided to just kind of have a little um, memento, and so we delivered 5,000 koozies with the, with the foundation logo on it to every teacher. Marissa was, spent six years as a teacher herself, so we allowed her to pick out what would be most valuable at a desk, and she picked uh, koozies with the foundation logo on it, so we delivered those. We've been having our breakfast, which is our really only fundraiser and main fundraiser, every year, as you can see. Those results are right there. It's gone up, 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 and up, thanks to the support and really the guidance of Dr. Don Stockton. This year, we well exceeded $150,000 gross. And as you can see, the net's not far behind because uh, our only uh, cost is the Marriott itself, where we have the breakfast. So we expect it to continue to grow. The Marriott grabbed us the day after this breakfast and said, you will tell us now when your next year breakfast is because we, we, we're running out of room for you. So that was a pretty good problem to have. And I want to mention real quickly at the, the very bottom line on the front page, I said, we call it balance toward endowment because we really don't have an endowment, but we would love to have an endowment. So every year after we pay out uh, uh, scholarships and after we pay our teachers scholarships, we kind of look and see what we have as a balance. Well, folks, it's over half a million dollars, and we're very, very proud of that because that's only happened over the past few years that we've been able to build that up. So um, at, for a long time, it was what came in went right back out, but um, now we're really building, and we expect that to continue as well. I'm not going to go through the detail of the rest, but the, I'll suffice to say the second page is this year's scholarships for students. Do we have any students here that receive scholarships this year? We usually have one or two, but not today. As you can see, uh, five of the high schools all got scholarships. Uh, our committee that picks these scholarships is blind as to where the students go to school. So we try to just, you know, we, t we take a, a maximum of 10 from each high school. And uh, that committee is very thorough, I can assure you. They make sure they've actually followed the rules. They've actually uh, come to, up to the criteria. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they're very generous once they award them. Actually, this year they awarded a few of these students more than one scholarship because we have several named scholarships. And then the third page are the educators that we gave scholarships to this year. 
Virtually every educator that applies, if they qualify for the scholarship, we give it to them. Uh, we don't have a limit. We like to, to give it to everyone that we can, and so 34 was a real good number for us. Are there any uh, educators here that received a scholarship? Come on up. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They always like to hear, so please introduce yourself. Tell them where you're going to school and uh, what you're vying for. I'm Jared Lambert. I'm the Instructional Technology Coordinator. I'm going to Sam Houston State University for my doctorate in Educational Leadership. Awesome. awesome. Sure. Right. <laughs> and we're really proud to help, help him out, and among a lot of others. Thank you very much for being here tonight as well. Lastly, that last page is the annual scholarship breakfast. We just like to make sure that you know who our really big supporters are. Uh, Multi-year, and I mean year after year after year, our major sponsor is PBK. Ian Powell's a very dear friend of the foundation, and they are wonderful to us. Uh, Elliser Constructors is equally as wonderful. They are our secondary um, sponsor, our guest speaker sponsor. They are also multi-year. And as you can see, there's some others there, and we list these because this is really the first time that we've had multiple people who have committed several years ahead, which is great. In other words, they say we're going to give X dollars and we're going to give it for the next three years. So we can depend on that as we go forward and continue to try to build. So we are, uh, we're very grateful to those people and we want you to know who they are as well. So questions? Anything you wanted to add? Did I miss anything? All right. Thanks so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you, Nelda. Thank you, Thank you Maris. <laughs> Next item on our agenda is Special District Recognition 2014 UIL Girls Shot Put State Champion, Dr. Stockton. I'd like to invite Tommy Johnson, principal of Oak Ridge High School, uh, up to the podium to introduce our coach and our recipient. Good evening. President Sanders, Dr. Stockton, and members of the board, we could not be prouder of our girls' state champion in the shot put, India Warren Jacks. India has done, had a fantastic high school career and done a fantastic job at Oak Ridge High School. And a lot of her credit goes to her coach. And at this time, I'd like to introduce the head girls track coach at Oak Ridge High School, Christina Duby. I wasn't exactly prepared to talk, but um, I first want to thank you guys for taking time out of y'all's busy meeting um, to recognize myself and my girl. Um, India came to us four years ago, and uh, she walked in my classroom, and I'm like, holy moly. <laughs> uh, she, is, she is everything what you see. Um, her heart is bigger than this room, um, and she displayed that at the state meet. She's, she went all four years, which is incredible. Um, as an athlete to get the opportunity to be top nine in the state. Um, but not only did she do that four years in a row, she medaled her junior year, she got third. Um, then this past year, she was ranked fourth in the state pretty much all year. And even through five throws, she was third in the state um, till her last throw. Uh, when I first took the, uh, the job at Oak Ridge, uh, our school record was 38, nine and a half, which is good. It's really good for girls. Um, but I had uh, Danielle Upshaw, she came through and busted it to 40 foot 11. <laughs> and then India kicked it out of the park. Um, she set our school record at 48, 10 and a half. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, uh, Coach Saban at UT, of course, salivating. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she signed in February, that's when the real worry began, <laughs> you know, because then the pressure is really on. She performed wonderfully and she did everything she set out to this season. It's been an honor, a privilege. Uh, I'm so excited for her, you know, to, to represent the University of Texas in their new, uh, new facilities, um, top notch. Um, but also to have Coach Tai, he coached the Olympic throwers at Beijing. So wow. she's in good hands. Awesome. Um, so thank you, and, and India. <laughs> I just want to say congratulations from the school board and on behalf of the rest of the members of the board we'd like to thank you so much for all your dedication to your sport and all the hard work we know you had to put into it so we'd like to present you with this and if you want to give a few words that would be okay okay 
Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this is pretty special to be recognized again with the board. So um, thank you for acknowledging me and taking the days out of your time to give me this this reward. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right, continuing on with the awards and recognition, Special District Recognition District Support Staff Ambassador Awards, Dr. Stockton. Yeah, I'll ask Dr. Hines to come up and introduce uh, the recipients for those awards. Thank you. Good evening, President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. Uh, as we just truly saw, we're very fortunate to, to get to work with so many outstanding students in our wonderful school district. And we also have, and it's been mentioned twice tonight by Mr. Kidd and Mrs. Blair, that we also have a wonderful asset in our staff. We have the greatest people, and it's it's also a great part of our jobs uh, is being able to work with these people. So tonight, I come forward uh, to bring to you for recognition uh, the Ambassador Award winners for our uh, district support areas in this building. And so I wanna, we have five people we're going to ask to come up as I call you out if you'll come up to the front. Um, first it, tonight is Janie Roth. Janie, you're going to come on up. She is in the Crickham Instruction Department Ambassador. She's been with Conroe for uh, five years now and serves as secretary to the director of curriculum and instruction. She's a leader in the curriculum and instruction department, has a great work ethic, has a very calm demeanor, uh, and can be counted on to help out whenever and wherever it is needed. And so she is a tremendous part of our team. Uh, the ambassador for the special education department is Gigi Weaver. Uh, Gigi's here, and she is the kind of person that every employer and every uh, employee desires to have on their team. Not only does she always remain professional, but she exemplifies to all a genuine kind-heartedness that builds trust, loyalty, and a sincerity of caring. She has worked 21 years in the district, nine years in her current position as the Special Education Financial Secretary. Also for recognition this evening is Rachel Jimenez. Rachel represents the Finance Department. She exemplifies the true meaning of all means all through her daily interactions with the district employees in the areas of payroll, um, her hard work and perseverance throughout her 12 years with the district, regardless of uh, any personal and professional circumstances, is truly remarkable. The Human Resources Ambassador representative is Terry Dozar, and with her almost 20 years in the district, 15 of those have been in her current position as a data entry specialist in the Human Resources Department, uh, where she is a very critical member. She remains a very hardworking employee who keeps the data of our employees up to date and accurate, and she has been a very loyal member of that department and the district. Also for recognition, we bring forward this evening Esther Rich from the Technology Department, and she um, has been with CISD since 1992. In addition to her position as secretary to our technology directors, uh, Esther has taken additional duties in that most of us know her as she's the lady behind the help desk. And so, <laughs> so when we call, we're often, we're often talking to Esther. And, uh, and for ordering technology, she's always mm -hmm. a team player and willing to help out in any way that she can. And each of these individuals um, represents the essence of the hard work that goes on in this building every day and they are our ambassadors for the district by performing their, their daily task with unwavering commitment to the children, the parents, and the employees of our district. And they're here for your recognition. Thank 
I don't know what else I can say except that I started today at noon with the district with Dr. Stockton's speech to the chambers today, and I've heard a lot about team, and uh, it's uh, evident that y'all are a large part of the team for each of your departments as well as the district overall. We appreciate and value each one of you as a board and as an administration. And thank you very much for being here tonight, and thank you for all you do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your work. Thank you for your help. With the help desk. <laughs> Thank you for your service to the district. We appreciate it. I know everybody likes the payroll lady, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time to sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 2D, Special District Recognition, Conroe ISD and Fine Arts Department. Dr. Stockton? I'll ask Dr. Hines to come back to the podium for this item. Thank you, Dr. Stockton, Mr. Sanders, members of the board. The NAM Foundation is a nonprofit organization committed to advancing music education through active participation. It was established in 1999, and they, the the BCME survey is a nationwide search for communities who provide access to music education as an essential part of the complete education and exemplify commitment and support for music education. The 15th annual survey measured a variety of factors, including budgetary commitment to music, opportunities to learn music, the presence of highly qualified instructors, certified music teachers, adherence to state and national standards, types of musical experiences offered and opportunities for performance and competition among others. A community had to show that they are committed to access and high standards for music education in all areas to be named a best community. And tonight we're uh, proud to share that um, for the third year in a row uh, and, and that Conroe Independent School District has received the NAM Foundation Best Communities for Music Education Award. So, right. Pat Paris is on vacation, so he couldn't be here tonight. So. Okay. Dr. Brown? Well, uh, typical. You asked me to present. <laughs> I did. The guy that, uh, and I'm grateful to be in a community like this. My kids uh, were very active in the fine arts. Uh, my uh, Both of them participate in bands at their schools. Uh, my daughter was a dancer. My son's a and ended up being a dance major at UT. My son was a studio art major at uh, North Texas. Uh, we had a proclamation from the governor, which didn't arrive. Uh, we have a recipient who's not here. Uh, <laughs> and that's true, because in my music career, the best way to describe my mu personal music career was that I had a music teacher tell me one time that I wasn't tone deaf but I did have the poorest ear-to-mouth coordination he ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> but I do appreciate the fine arts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <laughs> All right, item 2E, citizens participation. Ms. Ferris, is anyone registered to address the board? No. All right. We'll go to item 3, consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull any uh, items for discussion? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? As amended. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> All right. Item 4A, curriculum and instruction, preliminary star 3 through 8, and end of course results 2014. Dr. Stockton. If uh, I can ask Dr. Gibson and Dr. Null to come up and present those preliminary scores. Good evening, board members. Uh, President Sander, board, board members, and Dr. Stockton. 
Uh, tonight, Dr. Null and I would like to present the preliminary star scores for grades three through eight, as well as Dr. Null will present EOC and, of course, scores this evening. Um, following in the accolades uh, this evening, we have some great news to share, and we always have great news, great work ahead. Prior to that, I'd like to recognize uh, Julie English, who is our Director of Assessment, and Dana. Um, Boyer. I just got back from vacation. <laughs> I just got back from vacation yesterday. Who are in the assessment? Dr. Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> who are in the assessment center, and they spend a tremendous amount of time collecting, crunching the data, and preparing it for us. And they deserve these accolades as well. Uh, if you look, we see a three-year longitudinal trend here, and these data represent uh, in our English our students that took the uh, star score in English. As you can see that uh, we do mirror the state in a very small dip. However, uh, we are clearly outperforming the state in third grade reading. For those of you that um, have been recently on the board or even prior to, to 2010, Mel, you probably, Dr. Brown, you probably remember that, you know, we have always worked on our bilingual, our students that are taking the assessment in Spanish. And we continue to make great strides and we continue to improve. However, uh, we're not where we want to be. Uh, this represents um, about 254 students, which is approximately 6% of our total student population. And um, we um, certainly have work to do as well as um, helping these students grow. In mathematics, uh, you can see that we clearly, clearly are outperforming the state. And the same thing in mathematics. Uh, if you look at our trends from years ago, we have more students that are being successful in third grade math, as well as many of you might remember that we have what is called an early exit program. And that means that it is our goal for our students to be English literate, demonstrate their English literacy by third grade. There are, there are districts around us that have what is called the late exit program, and they hope to have that achieved by sometimes fifth and sixth grade. So in the big picture, our students are doing well, yet, as you see, we still have work to do. We know who these students are, and um, we also work, have worked very diligently in our curriculum department to add additional resources, software programs, uh, to continue to help our students that are, are taking the uh, star assessment in Spanish. I think, in fact, it might have been originated at the board level um, in Dr. Brown and Mr. Husband's tenure to challenge us to get the numbers reduced right. of kids taking the Spanish exam. And we've really lowered that number. You'll see the scores that lag behind the state average because we have an early exit program to get the kids into uh, the English testing. The, and the great news is you hear from CNI that our kids who exit early do very well on the English administered tests, so um, we're very we're very pleased with that trend of those numbers. What do we attribute to the Spanish, the, the lower scores, why they suffer as relative to the English? Wait a minute, that's not just, I don't think you understood what he said a while ago, that well, these these will include the Hispanic kids who are taking the English. But on the Spanish okay. side, that's just that's purely the Hispanic. We have an early exit program, so we, our, our challenges there are what we're trying to do is get the kids out of um, sp testing in Spanish as early as possible other schools a lot of other schools have a late exit program so you'll see their Spanish scores higher um, but the kids struggle because they're not in taking the English exam uh, in what we feel a timely manner so we try to we try to do that quicker than other districts on on whole I think we can yes say. Uh, Gibson how, how much uh, how many students in, in math uh, or, or I'm sorry, have you have you switched over, or did you switch back to reading? Fifty-one percent, you said, was uh, 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 in Spanish, but it was only two hundred fifty-four children. Yes, it, and so fifty fifty-one percent and forty-nine in in math. Excuse me, uh, whichever, or is it about two hundred fifty kids there as well? Uh, it is actually one hundred forty-six students. One hundred forty-six represents uh, three point five percent of our, our our third grade student population. Okay, but my question is. Is the is it fifty one percent of two hundred and fifty four passed? This is uh, or is two hundred and fifty one the number that, of passing? Never took it. I'm sorry. 
146 <laughs> students took the Spanish uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. And 49% of them And 49%, yes. yes. And, and, the standard. For, and versus 60, that is one reason why our number is so much higher over here, okay? Yes. Is because those Hispanic kids that have been excellent are, correct. are over there in the positive Yes, yes, okay. yes. you I'm are correct. Still, I'm still struggling with this. The, his, the, the, Spanish, the Spanish test taking kids that are still taking the Spanish, that, that's more so what I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. What's what's driving that number to be as low as it is? Have Some we identified the, that? I think it's a multitude of things in that um, we have had a transition from tax to star. The level of difficulty of these assessments are much stronger. They involve a high level of reading and a high level of rigor. We continue, not all of them are where they need to be. Some of them are coming in with backgrounds that they've not had exposure to uh, curriculums, to things in their environment that we may take naturally. We are working on building their vocabulary, their comprehension. Now what happens too is that this is not the end game for these students. We just say a third grade student, mathematics, we know who these students are, we know where they're going next year in fourth grade. And so when you look at our fourth grade, you look at our fourth grade scores, we have fourth grade mathematics, uh, we have one of our strongest trends that we've had over, say the last five years, is approximately 1% of our students that are still struggling to meet the standard. You have to remember that in looking at this, we're also talking about two different two different assessments. This STAR assessment is far more rigorous uh, than past tax. It's not every child, that is our goal. There's no question about that, every single child. But the work, you know, we also have, we look at what, what the students have succeeded in, and then we take them from where they are. We know the areas of their weaknesses. We know whether it's, uh, math fluency, whether it's numeration, and we'll take that. That is part of our study in curriculum and on the campus level, and we'll work with that with each one of these students on an individual basis. If you want to make that percentage look good, just don't move those kids yeah. out into the English. Dr. Gibson, I, think, yes. I don't know that it's possible. I don't know that it's possible, but of these 146 children, okay, is it possible to tell us at some future date, not tonight, uh, how many of those actually moved into the district for the first time this year? Yes. In other yes. words, you're getting them at some point in their language preparatory or in their education prep or whatever. Uh, it's a little harder to be accountable when you've just got those kids at some time during this school year. Yes, we're accountable, but you know, 146 children uh, in terms of you know, uh, uh, three and a half percent. I mean, yeah. And, we don't want anybody to fail. I mean, you know, we would zero percent would be our goal. Do we also know how many took it in 2013? Were there? I mean, you can have a small pool and have half pass or 67 percent. You have bigger pool and same number pass, but you just have a bigger pool. I'm just wondering if right. you know, right? Were there more or less in 13 than there were 14? Since you're trying to use the early exit and get them out of the Spanish test and into the English test. It just it, it, that'd be another question to add on to Mr. Husband's that I would have is what's yes. is the number getting larger, getting smaller? The number relative to our growth is getting smaller. Okay, that's it's, what I would it's expect. Getting smaller. That's what I would expect. But if we had a hundred and fifty some odd third graders take the Spanish test and, and a fifty percent passing rate last year, if we could track the kids that stayed with us to the fourth grade and see who passed after you'd had them for one or more years. I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's it, it's it's kind of you, you're kind of cutting your own head off when you early exit them. And I'm right. You're not. You right. are. I, I understand. Right. Just from right. a, from a from statistical, a visual, right. statistical yeah. standpoint. Yes. You're you're you're, you're, you're you're making your job a whole lot more uncomfortable. And I'm trying to defend you. Is all I'm saying. Well, and I, 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 I see it. I actually uh, thank you, Mr. Husbands. But that, that is our goal. And here again, when our students are taking when our when our students that predominantly have a Spanish-speaking background or a second language background, and they they get to the um, the STAR uh, assessment in English, they perform well and they continue to perform well. No. Uh, so 
Uh, I, I do think there is work ahead, but I think there is there there is work, uh, there is much success uh, along the way as well. Fair enough. I, I, I appreciate the argument of the the early exit, uh, as Dr. Stockton articulated. That was that was that 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 gets me a little bit better understanding what the numbers how the numbers have been driven. However, I just don't want us to take the approach that you know it's just 100 kids or Absolutely. 200 no. kids, um, and, the, and the benchmark is the state. So. The state has the same issues that we have in CISD, so not that if, argument. Not if, they, not if they don't exit. The early exit argument still hold, still still stands, and I, I can understand that it's driving the numbers as they are. Um, but at the same time, the kids that are there, I like for us to make sure that we're um, continuing to work toward getting those numbers where they need to be uh, relative to the state. Sands, I mean, even taking into account the um, early exit. And I think the early exit approach is the best approach. Um, I actually think that's going long term. That's the way we need to be. That's where we need to be focused on. But these, like you said, these numbers still stand out, stick out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. That's, 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 that was the only point I was trying to make. Right. So if you get it down to one and that one fails, that's a hundred percent fail. Right. Then right. you fail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fourth grade reading. Uh, we see a similar trend here. We see that we have outperformed the state, and uh, I think we just uh, hit, hit our, our major points in our fourth grade students uh, that are taking the assessment in Spanish. Um, fourth grade writing, oh, fourth grade writing. Uh, we have, uh, again, we have, we have outperformed the state, and um, writing, again, we have done very well over the years you know, we still have some work to do. Um, mathematics. Mathematics, we again, you can see that the state has moved two points and we have uh, remained at 87, but we've outperformed the state. And in mathematics, we have a pretty strong, although we have the 48%, we have a very strong, this represents 71 students. And here again, um, it is a small number. There's a tremendous of successes in here. But I also like to point out that we have an early exit because of a K-12 student that we have. And the sooner that our kids, this may look difficult and it is now, it is difficult, it's hard work. Yet, the sooner we get our kids successful in the lower grades, the better for performance they'll have for the rest of their career. Keep going to that. Okay, fifth grade reading. This is combined English and Spanish. This is the way this information was reported. Um, and we have clearly outperformed the state. The state has dipped and we have remained at 92% in reading. In mathematics, again, uh, we've moved one point forward and the state has moved one point, but we again have outperformed the state. And our fifth grade science, uh, this is another area that we have clearly outperformed the state. Uh, this, I can tell you that this, the number of students tested here in Spanish represents 25 students. And here again, every 25 counts. Um, but um, we are working, continue to work with our science students. And sixth grade. Mathematics and reading, and reading, we 90% 90, 90 very strong, uh, clearly have outperformed the, the state, and in mathematics, 91%, uh, and we've clearly outperformed the state, and in sixth grade, there is not an option of a Spanish assessment. So that's the other thing, is they kind of get to a cliff, is as we call it, they get to a cliff, and I think this is the great, great strong performance looking longitudinally as well. Well, that's great evidence of your plan work. Because in, if you don't have the option in sixth grade, uh, you know it's not about passing or failing mm -hmm. in third grade. Really, in the in the in the end result, it's it's right. all about graduating from high school, right? Absolutely. So I mean, this is evidence that you're getting the job done eventually, uh, and and I don't know. I, I, it's hard to argue that every because every child does count. I mean, yes. I understand that, yes. uh, but it's uh, it, your program seems to be working because we've been at this more than one year. Yes. Um, and part of that success is based on a comment that uh, Mr. Williams made to make sure we're focusing on those kids that aren't successful. So with a small number, a relatively small number of kids that haven't passed, we can really sink resources into every single child. Um, and we spend the fall 
as the principals will tell you at their campuses talking to academics and asking questions about pulling names up of kids who haven't been successful. What are you doing? What's in place to help these kids? And, um, but it's, it's very well very well shared with us and we appreciate it. That, that was my just basic question is district-wide about how many, not, not exact number, but ballpark children are taking the Spanish tests. Uh, like you had mentioned 146 and I think third grade math. But do you have a ballpark? I don't think I have that number. Do we have that number? Like across we a couple can, of grades? Or well, cro like in the district, is there? That was it for third well, grade. It depends no, on I, so. But I mean, just overall, for the, is it is it like 3,000 or, or 1,000 or yeah. less than 1,000? I guess my question is, do we well, feel like we have the resources to? Yeah. Um, I don't have that number. I don't have that number combined. Yeah, I was just what wondering I can, if what, it was more or less than 1,000. It's less than Right. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And some of these kids in, in, in reading the same kids in math. Gotcha. So, okay. It's a, it's a relatively, I mean, again, every number, every single percent counts, but it's a relatively small number. And the more they count, that's why I think it changes. Oh, I see. Okay. And the combined represents, if you look at the combined, it represents 3,925 students. Gotcha. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. It's uh, my pleasure to get to share with you the secondary results. And before I do that, I want to, it's been said a couple of times, but I want to um, go back to it one more time. And talk. I get to share this good news, but I get to share the hard work that goes on in our classrooms every day. And I know I see a few of our classroom teachers here. I want to say thank you to them. Uh, we have Ms. Upshaw here from our CNI department, the great work that they do to support them. So. We get to be the, the bearers of this good news, but the, there's great people out there that help make this happen. And, and you'll see this picture uh, on our secondary level as we continue, uh, once again, as Dr. Gibson said, it sounds redundant to continue to say we outperform the state, but we outperform the state. Um, we have, on the seventh grade level, uh, you can see that, you know, statewide there were some dips and, and our scores reflected that a little bit as well. Uh, we don't have the clear picture yet as to, as to why that may be. Um, we will get the answers to that, but we continue to perform very strongly, uh, outperforming the state for eight to 10 points in each of those categories. In eighth grade, you know, they take four exams. Our eighth grade scores, once again, very strong, uh, outperforming the state uh, across the board, uh, showing growth uh, in most of our areas uh, and continue to be uh, really strong. Now, EOC, this is a new picture. I know that last year we talked to you about uh, the changes in the EOC and the new the new rules. It used to be 15 exams, 15 EO, uh, end of course exams. It is now down to five. So we have reached a point where uh, those new rules are in effect for all of our students. So there are no more tax scores uh, for the high schools. So these five scores or, or uh, tests will we'll get to longitudinal data now moving forward. A few of these tests are new. Uh, the first two are tests that we have taken in the past, uh, Algebra One and Biology. And you can see in each of those, uh, we went up. I will tell you that overall, our EOC score is very strong this year. Uh, showed good growth in both of those uh, tests that we have taken. And a new test for us this year is the US history exam. You can see at 97% passing, uh, our juniors performed very strong in the US history exam. And then the English courses, this is different. Previously, uh, you had an, a writing test and a reading test. They were separate. They've now been combined and this is the first year, that's why you only see one year's worth of data here, um, because they were combined. And, and uh, once again, a strong performance over the state, certainly an area that we will continue to, to focus on. We want to improve our scores, but uh, outperform the state uh, by a strong margin. Question about the end of year. Yes, sir. Okay, 76, 77 percent of them passed English too. Yes, sir. Okay. They are predominantly seniors that took this test? No, sir. It's, it'd be freshmen and sophomores. Sophomore. But English one, freshmen, English two, sophomores. Now, they, they do have to pass these courses before they graduate. So they will continue to, to take those un, until they pass and prior to graduation. In, in spite of them, whether they're in the class or not? Or do you 
fail the class if you fail the exam? No, sir. You could you could pass the course and fail the exam, and in that case, our schools provide remediation Remedi to help them pass the, the exam. So it would be outside important. the classroom, but uh, but during school remediation, so that they can come back and pass. Yes, sir. And so they have how many more attempts at this? Class? Multiple opportunities. You have an October when they take. There's an October retest, a spring, year, year plus summer, two years. Yes, sir. Uh, our times two years. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Knoll. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Next item is 4B, consider approval of purchase of Canvas Learning Management System. Dr. Stockton. Dr. Hines, if you'll come back up to the podium. We get a lot of podium time tonight, Dr. Hines. I'm really excited about coming up for this item. Um, President Sanders. Members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's a um, it's a great privilege to be able to come forward tonight to ask uh, for your approval uh, for us to purchase Canvas Learning Management System. Canvas is a cloud-hosted learning management system that's developed by Instructure. This is a software that will allow our teachers to uh, a place to store their coursework and receive and grade student assignments. They can integrate online discussions, videos audio images or any content that they have in the system. Uh, Canvas also includes a parent portal so as the use of the product spreads through the district, parents will have a single place to check assignments for all of their children that are in any of our schools and it, it all comes up on one place. Uh, and we, we, we selected and are recommending this um, particular product after evaluating several over a year-long process that was headed up by Terry Ross and Terry couldn't be here tonight she's out of town and I know it's probably driving her crazy because this is near and dear to her heart um, but this has been um, a very um, long process so there was a selection committee of 28 professionals and the committee specifically was chosen that all the feeder systems as well as all the levels of schools were included we also had teachers, administrators, technology staff, curriculum instruction staff, as well as uh, we wanted people that were also parents that wanted to look at it from the parent angle. Um, we intentionally included uh, people with varying technology skills as well, so because we were looking for something that would be easy to use. And really when it came down to it, we, we looked at several, based on our criteria, we narrowed it down to three. Um, the final three were Canvas, Blackboard, and Schoology, and all three are really good product they're all different in different ways and they do different things and um, and really after this result um, the ease of use and the ability to eliminate several of the products that are currently that our teachers currently use uh, kind of weighed into it and this was uh, the really the consensus favorite product of the three and we believe that this is going to be uh, welcomed by not just our teaching staff but our parents and this will be a multi-year phase in because we'll have to bring it on and do training and um, but we're really excited about it, um, and we are asking your approval this evening. I move. What's the, what's the price? We have a motion. Let's get a uh, second. We can second. 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 Okay, thank you. Now we can have our discussions. The price is, uh, it's a three-year, I and mean, we have a three-year price because we're phase-in. The first year would be $171,250, and that includes the implementation and licenses. Uh, year two, uh, is 150,000 because we'll bring on more user. I mean, it will be less of the implementation, but we'll still have not the full range of users. And the third year goes up to 270,000 because that's when we're probably pretty much turning it on everywhere. We don't envision that we'll run it everywhere from day one because it's going to be a training piece. And we'll, we'll have some teachers that will start using it from day one because they want to, and we're going to give them access. Um, but it, it is one of those things that we'll have to gradually uh, migrate folks over it should replace teacher web pages because everything that you'll need to look up will be there at this place uh, syllabus calendars uh, those kinds of things so um, it will eventually make some of the other things we do obsolete uh -huh. who's monitoring what goes up to the cloud in terms of no, that's okay I don't worry about it. Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff goes in the cloud one of the one of the better features that we like is the ease of video on this particular product because we have a lot of teachers now that upload a lot of video content they're yeah, taping themselves and, and so they're it's all over the place right now and so really that's one of the things we're trying to do is have one place you go to get those things okay. well, in, we've got the prices for the ones you want to buy how does that compare to the 
of the two products that you found? This, this was the most expensive of the three that we looked at. All of them were fairly close range um, in terms of pricing. That some of them vary from year to year depending on implementation. Um, this was the most. Probably Blackboard was the second expensive, and then uh, Schoology was the third. Okay. Well, then what what was it that? I mean, if we're paying more money, what did what's the key thing that? Ease of use, uh, layout, appearance. You know, it probably the biggest name in this particular arena is Blackboard. They've been around the longest and have built their platforms. And and from someone who's familiar with it, having used it in my doctoral studies, mm -hmm. I, I knew it, and so it was very appealing to me. But having not seen this product until going through this process myself, and I'll just speak from my perspective, um, I definitely thought it was it was more appealing for the people in the room in terms of how you navigate and how you move through it and find things. And, and so it just seemed to be a, a feel for it. I, I thought it was rather remarkable today. We had a very informed parent at, at Chamber ask Dr. Stockton when a product like this was going to be implemented in the district. And he said, well, tonight if uh, and he looked right at me and he said, you know, it's kind of like I was told I got I to gotta vote for this. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Stockton. <laughs> you know, but but seriously, uh, as a parent, you know, um, of of three good children, I mean, I'm I'm very blessed. But you know, you, as a parent, you still need to stay on top of their, you know, the, they 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 can they can lead away. And so the syllabus and the, especially in the in the upper grades where where the homework assignments are, a lot of times turned in by email, and and you have less control over. You know, in third grade, you pretty much have all the control because you know exactly what they have in their in their in their backpack, as they say. But uh, but you don't you don't as they get older and they have more control over their lives. And so I think this is essential. And uh, as when I was a rookie on the board, uh, I, there was a hundred thousand dollar expense brought to the board for Anova, and I asked the same question. You know that that. Uh, Mel asked, is, is, you know, is this just another program? Are we just throwing more money? You know, I guess that trust factor wasn't there. I am absolutely behind this team when it comes to what y'all decide. I, I've learned my lesson about questioning. I'm, I'm, I, I want you to be responsible with the dollars too, but if y'all say you need it because you really need it, and as a parent, I'm all for this. And so, and currently in the area, I know. I know Katie is using this product, and Pearland uses this product, and uh, similar size district does. McKinney has just has got on board with this, and then uh, University of Texas is switching over from Blackboard to Canvas. They're going through that. Well, It'll that, be a multi-year reason phase. enough alone to, 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 to go with this product. I think it's a really important conversation that you guys had comparing the more technical Blackboard versus uh, Canvas because it is a really technical, Blackboard is very technical and very heavy for the teacher use. Um, but I'm wondering, are you guys going to migrate over your stuff from the Moodle server that you currently have? Are you going to do that for the teachers or are they going to be responsible for doing that we're, themselves? We're going to, in some areas, we're going to do it and then some it's not. I don't think there's a mass migration feature I'm looking. Wait, there is. There is. Okay, there is an upload. I'm, I'm also looking. Yeah, it, it probably operates on common cartridge. I was just wondering if you guys were going to be doing that for the teacher, if that's going to be another thing that we're going to be asking teachers to be responsible for. Because I know some teachers use it very heavily in Moodle. So. Yes, in like science. I mean, that's mm -hmm. all of our science is in Moodle. And, and for those of you that are wondering, Moodle is a is a free platform that a lot of people have put content in and and use. But we haven't had a standardized platform really as a district, and that's really really just started with a parent uh, inquiry. Uh, about 18 months ago, we started getting questions like, I, I, you know, as a parent, I'm, I'm going to four locations for all these different things. Why can't it be just one place? And when mm -hmm. are y'all going to make up your mind what you want? And but we we tried to be deliberate about trying to get something. And, and I'm going to be realist. I mean, as much as stuff changes, these products didn't exist several, a few years ago. There'll be something new a few mm -hmm. years from now. But but I think where we are right now, uh, that this is welcome, and this is certainly something that will be put to use. Are we locked into the three years? Or, I mean, if, it, if the first year happens, it comes along and you notice that it's not working out, people aren't using it, or what, whatever, are, is, are we As I understand in? it, we can, obviously, it's a year-to-year. -year, okay, because uh, it's new. Uh, Canvas, Canvas is really new, right? It's a year-to-year it's -year arrangement, and they're a fairly new mm -hmm. company from the from the different ones we looked at, and probably Blackboard's been there the longest. Um, but 
the, the content that we place there will always be ours. And there's a very, I know I checked on that, is how hard is it to get our stuff back? And we've already looked at how easy it is to pull things back. And so if yeah. something were to go wrong, it, it, when I understand, it seems to be not a challenge to get our content back out. Dr. Hines, I didn't mean to make light of the security aspect, but I am concerned. Do we have the resources to, to kind of monitor what's what's in this cloud? I mean, are we, because it seems that seemingly everyone is going to have access to send stuff up and, you know, and everyone can, students or whomever has that. Do we have the resources necessary to make sure we're monitoring content, that kind of thing, on the IT side of things? I guess that may be a better question for Terry. Terry, where's Terry? They're on, on their sites in LMS. I mean, we won't be policing that as technology, but we have filters for stuff coming back in that we'll be able to catch things that way. And, you know, and I think we, all of us worry about how safe is our stuff when somebody else has it. And I think there's always some threats, but that's become a part of our uh, way of that's, doing business. That's industry. Okay. That's just what we do. And, but, and the signs are only our staff, right? I mean, they're they're the only ones that will be uploading. Yes. Items into the cloud. Well, yes. the well, the students can the teachers can put their assignments it, right? up, and the, and the teachers have great control over what they want to have seen, what they don't want to have seen, what conversations just between two people, what the yeah. conversation is between the whole class. The so they can set those as a as a teacher. Do we have the resources to kind of man this 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 program? We have, uh, actually earlier this year, we added a couple of instructional coaches in the technology area, and I know uh, I'm looking over at Jared's here tonight, but this will take, um, we've, we've had rollouts before like this. It takes a lot of planning. Uh, it does take staff. It takes a, a game plan. Of, we are very fortunate to have those that are early, what I call early pioneers that get out because they want it. They're already using similar products. They want this. They learn it fast. They teach their peers. They, they and so we, we use a multi kind of a layered approach. We'll have classes and courses and we'll bring it out. Obviously, the, the, from, a, from a priority standpoint, our, our high school students benefit the most, the quickest, because they're going to graduate soon and they're going to go to universities that use these types of products. But all of our teachers have see value in this. And we were, even in the presentations, the elementary teachers like, like this product a lot because of the way they could customize it to make it look elementary page, you know, that looked like. They didn't want it to look too college looking. They wanted it to look like their their bulletin board kind of a thing. So different people like different things about the product. And I understand that our, our teachers will be posting videos, whatever, to this, okay? And 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 they're professionals and I mean, you know, we have filters and so on and so forth about what can be brought into the system. But when the students post their assignments, okay. Who can see that assignment besides the teacher? Just the teacher. Okay, so that even if it was inappropriate in some way, form, or fashion, correct, it would be strictly the teacher getting it, right? Yes. I mean, we can't yes. prevent students from behaving, misbehaving in the no, no, classroom, no, no. anyway. So and and that's really exactly what I'm saying. But no other student would be exposed yeah. to that. I mean, they don't have a public posting correct capability right here. Right? Yeah, and, and you know, and there and there are different there are protocols and things that go into play. Where if you set up a discussion group, you have a moderator in place, somebody who's going to watch and turn it off if it gets out of control. And and as Ms. Powell mentioned, I mean, that's a risk we run every day in a classroom conversation that somebody could say something inappropriate. And those same challenges exist in the online world as well. Other yeah, comments? I, I hear you, but you can copy and paste online, not in the classroom. So I understand that, and I, I, I do agree with you guys on the need for the software. So we're good. The other question I had, Dr. Hines, you said that uh, some of this canvas would replace the teacher web pages. Some or all? I mean, eventually are we gonna, a, it's going to be gone. I mean, eventually, I, I just have to be a realist. So we're going to be tomorrow. having to support both well, the web pages I and Canvas. I envision as a teacher moves into Canvas that they will abandon a web page and that this will become their web page. This will be where, as a parent, if you wanted to know about what's going on in your child's class, you're going to this site. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that because if there's taking them four to now, we're going to get it down to one. But some are using the web pages and some are using Canvas. Is there going to be a time period in which we're not 
from our uh, technology standpoint, not going to support. support. Yes. Yeah, and, that. I, and I'm hoping this is in the third I get year. Back to Mr. Williams' question about resources. It's difficult yeah. to try to support both when you're trying to. Yeah. I just want to be careful not to, to promise something I sure don't know. But I, I, our goal is a three-year phase in. Okay. Well, would that save us money? Uh, speaking, going back to the to the monetary value, would that save us money as we did away with that other? What do you call it? A platform or, or web pages or whatever you call it? Not not a significant not amount. significant amount. <laughs> Other comments or questions? We have a motion to approve and a second. All those in favor and all those opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hines. I'd like to thank Dr. Hines for his leadership. This has been an 18-month process. And thank you, Dr. Thank Hines. You. And <laughs> thank you. Item 5A, bond referendum update. Dr. Stockton. All right. Uh, Mr. Foster, come up and show us what you're working on this summer, please. Good evening, President Hines. Members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's my pleasure tonight to bring you an update on the capital improvements that are going on. As you recall, last month we talked uh, about some, most of our projects we're doing this summer, uh, they're ongoing, our general fund rather than bond referendums. So we changed the name of the slide to, to match that. Starting at the Oak Ridge High School ninth grade campus, uh, this campus is getting uh, classroom additions. So what you're looking at now is the infrastructure going in the, the critical summer work to get out of the way so that school can resume in August. Mm. Cool. Uh, okay. Well, what you're looking at are the areas that are open currently. Uh, progress is being made as planned. The project is on schedule. A lot of this work is inside the uh, the actual classroom expansions are, are, are beginning their processes now. Uh, the important part of this program is to expand the parking lot. Uh, what you're looking at is a picture from late last week. If you drove through that campus today, you'd see a lot of concrete paving in a, that was placed uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. Mm. Oak Ridge School Road Improvements. This is the area in front of uh, what the picture you're looking at now is the area in front of the Oak Ridge ninth grade campus looking back towards Oak Ridge Elementary. The uh, concrete paving in that section is, is essentially complete. Uh, there will be some striping to go along as the project moves forward. But this roadway was previously asphalt. It is now concrete. So the, the program here is to uh, make this the, uh, the school zone for that area. As you can see here, this is an early morning picture of the concrete floor of the roadway in front of Oak Ridge High School in this section. And we're moving the roadway over a, a full roadway width to allow for expansion of the Oak Ridge High School parking lot. So this is, a, if, again, if you drove through there last Thursday, you had a, a maze of detours to get, get through. On the other end of this campus, other end of this project, is a uh, cutting and access into Woodson Road from the parking lot at Hauser Elementary. Uh, what you're looking at now are the drainage improvements to build the bridge to cross the, uh, the uh, uh, DD6 drainage feature. At Vogel Intermediate, uh, the additions of the classroom addition there again, uh, last week we had an early morning slab pour, so the uh, foundation slab for that addition is, is progressing well. I would like to point out, too, in the whole Oak Ridge area, as well as Conroe in general, but since school got out, we've had 25 rain days. So they're, they're struggling mm. to make, make their schedules, but so far we are, uh, we are being able to make up the, the dry time during the day and get rid of the water that comes in in the evenings. Mm. At Knox Junior High, Oh, there's the van. Uh, this is a mostly interior project. I mean, the, the project is is proceeding as planned. All of the summer phases are opened up inside Knox Junior High. They are working uh, as we planned and uh, working towards a, a a new air conditioning system, new fire sprinkler system for that building, a new roof system for that building. So it is, that overall is going well. Also attached to this project are some uh, improvements to Bach Auditorium at McCullough Junior High. Uh, the large equipment, the uh, chiller for that system, the, the air hammock for that system, those things are in place now. The lighting project is underway. And uh, what we, the last phase of that, that building's uh, air conditioning retrofit is underway and progressing well. So both of these schools, Knox and McCullough, will be ready for school when the school opens in August. The multi-campus front entry security upgrade. If you recall, this is 24 campuses, so this is just a representation. The, uh, the, the hardware that we're installing, you're seeing here at the right-hand side of the doors, get a intercom to communicate with staff inside the building and a card reader to allow uh, controlled access. 
all of the hardware across 24 campuses is approximately 95% installed. So we're about a week away from uh, working through the, the pre-functional testing to make sure they work. Uh, our technology department has the phones uh, that are being programmed now mm -hmm. to, be, uh, to be implemented here. So we are uh, approximately a week ahead of schedule for this particular project, so it is, it is going uh, very well. The multi-campus skylight project, uh, we have six campuses, David, Gladys, uh, Anderson, Meesinger, Bush, and oh. out. Uh, those, uh, the big feature of those buildings when they were built was a large skylight of the library and the gymnasium. What you're looking at here is an interior picture of the finished product at David Elementary. Uh, you could recognize it by the castle and the library. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but you're seeing what it looks like from the bottom side now that the skylights are gone and the, the actual roof structure is installed over the top of it. Uh, this is a picture of the same building uh, in the uh, cafetorium area. Uh, so it, it act, I, I believe uh, it is going well. Uh, the projects are going well and the, uh, the interior of the buildings are, are turning out as we planned. At Travis Intermediate, this is a brick replacement project on the original parts of those buildings. Uh, the, that project is now progressing well. Even they've suffered some uh, some rain delays as well. Uh, this project is one that's going to extend into the school year. That we had planned on on that as well. So you're looking at the uh, end of the auditorium section of the building, and they're in the process of working their way around. So we're we're almost done, or actually we are done with the major demolition of the brickwork. And now we're starting to put it all put it all back together. That project is as scheduled or is going as planned and is on schedule. And those are the major projects. Just one quick question uh, on yes, the, on the lights. Uh, are they going to be a, uh, put in all year long? I mean, I'm, I'm seventeen thousand lights takes a long time. I mean, are you talking about LED light fixtures? That, that, when is that? How is that project going to go forward? Just well, in general. Well, that, it's not on this list yet because that project actually starts installations next week. Uh, so that project will, will start July 21st and will be, all the light fixtures will be complete uh, by November 15th. And so is it at night around uh, yes. around kids somehow? Yeah. Non-disruptive? Well, even, uh, even starting what they're starting, they're starting at uh, the Willens High School next week. They're starting that work mostly in the evenings and weekends to avoid staff, avoid conflicts with just the minor goings-ons even during the summer. So that program will be mainly at night on weekends in the off hours uh, away from work. Thank you. That close okay. enough. Thanks. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Thank you. Appreciate your help. <coughs> <laughs> Item 6A, financial reports. Dr. Stockton. Mr. Rice, if you'll come present those reports, please, or that report. <laughs> Good evening, President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. I'm here to present the financial statements for the district uh, for the month of June. Uh, these statements will include the general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. Uh, the first statement we'll look at is our balance sheet. The balance sheet includes our assets, liabilities, and fund balances uh, for each of the funds. Uh, just like to point out, I know we, we always like to look at our cash and investments, and uh, uh, as you can see, the majority of our funds are invested in, in, in various uh, investments. Um, I'd like to point out if you look, you know, some of the smaller items are just kind of intrigued. Y'all might, might have questions. If we look at other, we see $35,874 in the general fund. What is that? And it's amazing, but the majority of that is hot checks. People owe us money for checks that, that, that have bounced. So, so that's an area in, 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 in there. Uh, if you look at other and liabilities, that's the amount of money that $4,197 is the amount that we owe to the state for sales tax for items that we sell at our campuses that we're required to pay sales tax. So that's just a couple of items I just thought I'd share with y'all. Income statement shows the revenues and expenditures with the district. Uh, the thirty-five thousand dollars again. Uh huh. What were the checks written for? Uh, various all various uh, summer school tuitions to books to whatever they like a student might pay library for fines library fines i mean we, we have checks as small as a dollar and you know <laughs> you know up, up to several hundred dollars band fees instrument repair fees stuff like that just just all kind of various various items right, just curious. and looking at our, our revenues at the local sources 
as you can see in the general fund and debt service, once again, property taxes is our largest uh, revenue source. Uh, food services from food sales and self-funded insurances from our premium contributions. A slight change in our general fund balance as y'all approved the LED project. Uh, this month in the, in the budget amendment, there was a, a $4 million budget amendment to pay for the LED project. So you've seen this, this projected increase decrease by that $4.2 million. Yeah, I had a question. Yes, sir. On the food, can we go back one? On the balance from the food program, or the food program, uh -huh. or the monies that's paid for, for, for cafeteria, whatever. Uh -huh. Do we ever raise those rates? Are those numbers adjusted, or is it, is it flat? I mean, does it ever come? It's, it's never come to the board to where we're raising the cost of lunch. I think I think when prices do change on that, those are brought to the board. They're, they are brought to your attention. Um, is, is that is that not true? Um, yeah, like if we increase the five cents or but basically the, the we we are raising the rates next year to match the federal. We're required by law to sell at the same <coughs> rate as the as the federal reimbursement, and so we just match that rate. So that's and kind of an olive pot for you. What's that? That's kind of an olive pot for you. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it goes into yeah. it. And we are raising it. I forget how. It's a, yeah, neither a nickel or a quarter. I can't. I think it's a yeah. quarter. Yeah. How about how about your retail? Does that does that differ? Uh, I don't know how to put that. Um, free and reduced lunch. Is you, you, what you what you charge? Is that is that is that set as well for a? Yeah. Well, well what we charge we for charge a full pay student. Yeah. yeah I don't know how to say. That's yeah, what I'm right. saying. We we set it at the same at rate. The same rate. The reimbursement okay. rate. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. We, we have to charge at least as much as the federal government reimburses us. What federal agency is that? Is that USDA? Department of Agriculture. Department yeah. of Ag. Yeah. 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 So we are we are flat with them. We're not right. premium on them. Right. Right. No cost plus. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no change in our projection of our debt service fund balance from the previous month. Uh, no change in our projection on our child nutrition fund balance from previous month. Uh, Self-funded insurance. Uh, June, we, we broke even for the year. We're still uh, revenues over expenditures of about 714000 so it's still tracking good. And our participation at our wellness centers is uh, still going very strong. Our uh, $109 million bond transition plan, we've currently spent $56.5 million in that plan. Uh, our estimate to complete is an additional $49.1 million uh, for a total project of $105.5 million, uh, leaving us with a contingency of roughly $3.5 million in that, in that plan. Our investments for the month, at the end of May, we had $301 million invested. Uh, at the end of June, $281 million. As we know, the, the average maturity of our pools in the Capital One is one day. Uh, our U.S. Treasury notes and CDs that were out there longer term, the WAM, that's about 735 days. So taking that all into consideration with our full portfolio, our portfolio's WAM is 74 days. The yield to maturity of our portfolio is uh, 0.216. And our benchmark, the 90-day T-bill, is uh, two basis points. You're 10 times better than a benchmark. Right. That's right. Good job. That's all we have. Good job. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Item 8 is executive session. Closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice for this meeting as authorized by sections 551.072 and 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be either at A, this public meeting upon the reconvening of this public meeting, or B, at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. The time is 7.13.
with some dessert too. You ate up cake. Oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> The board is now in open session. The time is 8.04 p.m. The next item on the agenda is item 9, legal, and item uh, legal at 9A, excuse me, consider approval of contract to sell property to the Ark Church. Is there a motion? Motion. A motion, I move that the district resolve to sell approximately 8.5 acres of surplus real, real property to the Ark Family Church in accordance with Texas Local Government Code, Section 272.001, and the terms set out in the purchase and sale contract for the fair market value of $205,000. There's a second. motion and a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor and all those opposed, motion carries. Item 9B, consider approval of contract to sell property to A&M Interest, Inc. Okay. I move that the district resolve to sell approximately 1.0021 acres of surplus real property to A&M Interest, Inc., in accordance with Texas Local Government Code Section 272.001 and the terms set out in the purchase and sale contract for the fair market, for the fair market value of $250,996. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor? And all those opposed, and the motion carries. We have a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor? Let's leave. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for everyone. Oh, oh.